celebrate your bishop for the gift of God that he is to the body of Christ. Can you please put your hands together? Celebrate this bishop. <clears throat> He came to Ghana and reap our church. And the bishops and the pastors and everybody and myself, I mean, uh, I preached on tithing and offerings for many years and he brought a dimension of the tithe that changed my whole life. And finances of the church tripled. Our finances tripled from that day. And And he brought such a reverence and a fear of God. You know, that was never there. People are given with such understanding and revelation like has never been there before. And he's allowed money to come into the hands of so many for the work of the ministry that was never there before. And um, I understand that when you tithe, it's not just about the money. It's a principle that you give God authorization to rebuke the devourer and to protect the 90. And if you don't give him the first 10, he doesn't have authorization to rebuke the devourer and to protect the 90. Uh, such a deep, deep revelation that has transformed so many lives. And I told Bishop, uh, I'm going to be an ambassador of that message so everywhere I go, before I preach, the first thing I do is to deal with tithes and offerings. Hallelujah. And um, some places I tell them, some places I tell them I, get, I got the revelation from Bishop Donnie Mears, and other places I tell them it's my own revelation. <laughs> I just want you to laugh about that. Amen. And um, this church, I, I'm part of this church in many, many, many ways like you don't know. I remember in the early 70s when I was in Bible school, Bishop's dad used to come and preach in the Bible school in Nigeria where I studied in Benin City. And he used to send members of your choir to come there and teach. And I used to be part of the choir. And there was a lady from Evangel that I was supposed to marry. Yeah, in the early 70s. I don't know if she's still here. <laughs> but if you are still here, this is me anyway. <laughs> I'm taking and you are taking. I think she got married too. She what? I'm telling you. But anyway, you used to sing some songs that really brought revival to our churches in Africa. One of them is there is excitement in the air. Yes. What happened to those songs? And God never fails. He abides with me. He gives me the victory. Where are those songs? The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. And so many of those songs, Lord have mercy, you bless us, you stir us up, and I think you got to bring back all those songs again. So many memories, amen. And you challenge, you challenge our churches in Africa. Your music and everything about you brought revival to churches all over Africa because every year you send your choir to come and Bishop John was there. You impacted our lives. I believe it's time for God to revisit you. It's a time for God to revisit his people. 
You are not excited about it, but it doesn't matter. I'm with you this morning, tomorrow night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night, and I'll tell you why. I've been preaching for 41 years, and I'm tired of church as usual. And if we don't go the extra mile and do something more than church as usual, I'm not a prophet of doom, but I've seen the enemy kill too many good folks in church and destroy too many churches. And it's only because he has succeeded to get the church in a place of comfort. And we feel like, you know, I've been in church for so many years and there's nothing new. What else? But folks, I'm telling you, there are things you have no idea of that God has in stock for all of us. Let me ask a question before we pray. How many of you have received a prophetic word and it hasn't yet come to pass? Just give me a wave offering, a wave offering. I'll tell you something. When my mother took seed of me, she was told that she was carrying a prophetic seed. She bled for four months and she laid in cold blood and she was anemic. And the doctor said she wasn't going to be able to carry the pregnancy. So they performed, they did a procedure on her to remove the pregnancy, and they did. Months after the pregnancy was aborted, they realized that her stomach kept growing. So they went back to check, and they realized that we were twins. And the procedure took one and left the other in, and that was me. Now, after that, the enemy tried to kill me tried to kill me and they did another procedure on my back. I was with Dr. Z the other day and she saw this, this scar on my back and said, what happened? And I told her, and it was when I was a kid and I almost died. And they have to go into another procedure to rescue my life. The other one was this, where I was compelled by demonic powers to put my hand in fire and my hand started burning and I used to be on drugs. I used to be on drugs crazy and to kill me. I'm saying this to tell you something about our ignorance about prophecy. Because sound man work with me. One of the, the dangers of prophecy in the body of Christ that folks don't understand and appreciate is this. That whenever the word of the Lord comes concerning an individual, a family, a nation, a church, a community, a son, a daughter, a grandson or a granddaughter, it gives the adversary an indication of what God is about to do. And so he throws everything he has on that individual, that nation, that family, that church to stop the manifestation of that prophecy. Remember when the wise men came and they saw the star of Jesus and they went to Herod and revealed to Herod what they saw, what they saw. And the prophets came and said, The thou, O Bethlehem of Judea, out thou not the least among all the cities of Judea and yet out of thee shall come a ruler of my people. And the Bible said when he heard the name, the ruler of my people, he was vexed. And he gave command, kill all the male children under the age of two. Kill them all. Same thing with Moses. When Joseph gave the word that when the deliverer comes and you are living, take my bones with you. That word went out there. And they said, we have to kill all the male seed of the Hebrews to make sure that they are never delivered and set free. 
And the church is very ignorant because I've seen folks in church, they receive a prophetic word and after that, every all hell breaks loose. And they're doing well in their business and the word of the Lord come, I'm going to prosper you, I'm going to bless you and suddenly their finances dries up. I'm going to bless your marriage and the man starts having an affair and the woman begins to fool around and everybody says, what's going on here? God gives a word about a son and a daughter and you find the son crazy and the daughter fooling around and folks don't understand. It's a reaction. Somebody say reaction. Somebody say reaction. It's a reaction from the underworld and the church don't understand it. So I'm going to be talking to you this morning and I'm declaring by the blessing of Bishop a 72 hours fasting and prayer. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday because we got to break some chains. We got to destroy some yokes. We got to set some people free. Somebody say, I hear you. Lift up both of your hands. Say in the name of Jesus. By divine authority. I break loose from the demons of my bloodline. I break free from the curse of my ancestors. And in the name of Jesus, I break free from the yoke of my bloodline. And I lose myself from my father's demon, from my mother's demon, from my father's yoke, from my mother's yoke, from my father's curse, from my mother's curse. I break free right now in the name of Jesus and I command the adversary, take your hands off me right now. Take your hands off my body. Take your hands off my family. Take your hands off my finances. Take your hands off my children. Take your hands off my loved ones. Satan, by the power of Jesus' name, take your hands off me right now. Take your hands off this house. Take your hands off the atmosphere. Hands off. In Jesus' name, give somebody a high five and tell them hands off. Hands off. Hands up. Amen. All right, be seated. I have some books here. I'm going to encourage you to get as much as you can, but it's a particular one I'm going to speak out of, and I'm going to ask some people to sow because I brought a few of those books, so I'm not going to sell it. I'm going to have some people sow and take it. Amen. Turning your pain into power. Pain is an indication that something is wrong. And you got to go past the pain to find out what is the cause of the pain. Because if you don't know what the cause of the pain is, you will just be dealing with the pain, which is the symptom, and you'll never fix the cause of the pain. Turning your pain into power. Hallelujah. Prayer moves God. There is something about prayer that it moves God. You need to get it. Enforcing prophetic decrees. Binding the strong man. I'll be talking a little bit also from this book. And it has to, it has to do with principalities and powers because it seems to me that the church is so ignorant about the reality of the spiritual world. We don't seem to understand what we are into. And folks just feels like, you know, it's just what you see. No, it's not true. There are cosmic powers governing nations and governing communities and governing families and governing churches I've been to cities where you see churches growing mega churches and you see one particular church under so much demonic concentration and so much attack of the forces of darkness and I says Lord why and he says because that church and the leadership of that church is the prophetic and apostolic voice for that city. And so the enemy don't mind all those churches doing well. His worry is that church that holds the prophetic and apostolic voice for that city. So if the enemy can exert on that church and on the leadership of that voice, he doesn't matter if you fill the stadium. 
Because footballers always fill the stadium. So the devil is not worried about who fills the stadium. He's worried about who has the prophetic and apostolic voice to interrupt his assignment for that city and to bring revival to that nation and to keep the heavens open over that city and community. The devil don't worry himself and bother himself about cities or individuals he has already conquered and captured. And that's why it is believed that good people die before their time. Because there is this mentality in the church that if I'm a good person, I don't last over anybody. I don't covet somebody's wife or husband. I don't think ill of anybody. I'm a good person. And God automatically protects me. It is not true. It's a lie. You are the devil's target. And let me explain that to you. The target of evil is good. And evil is not satisfied till it destroys good. So being good is not enough. You need to have illumination. You need to have revelation. Because the enemy's target is you. Trying to be good. Trying to serve God. Trying to do the will of God. You are his target. Not the ones who are already messing up and fooling. Because he has them already. You are the one he's interested in. Somebody say, I hear you. I hear you. Hallelujah. Now, binding the strong man will help you to understand the job descriptions of the five cosmic powers, principalities, powers, rulers, spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. It will help you to see what each one does. They have job descriptions. And it's real. And they work. And if you don't understand it, the enemy can mess with you. Praying through the promises of God. This will help you to understand that for every promise of God, there are conditions. The promises and the prophecies are not automatic. And that is what the body of Christ is ignorant of. People think that, oh, I have a prophecy. God is going to bless me. And then they go to sleep and they get excited and they tell everybody about it. You are joking. When the word of the Lord comes to you, it's a time to rise up in prayer like never before. And it's a time to fast like never before. It's a time to do warfare. It's a time to contend. For the word of the Lord like never before because the adversary will come after you. 1 Timothy 1.18 Look at 1 Timothy 1.18 He said, Son Timothy, this charge I give unto you according to the prophecies that First went... Timothy 1.18 uh -huh. This charge I commit unto thee, Son Timothy, according to the prophecy which went before on thee, that thou might have war a good warfare. That thou... By them might as what? War a good warfare. That thou by them might as? War a good warfare. So when the prophecy comes, it comes to empower you to war. Warfare, a good warfare, by revelation. It reveals to you God's original intent. And what God has planned for your life. God's intention concerning your life. Whether short term, medium term or long term. It's revealing and opening up and giving you windows. To see into the future. Or I call it advanced knowledge. Somebody say advanced knowledge. Advanced knowledge. Say it again. Say advanced knowledge. Advanced knowledge. So prophecies are advanced knowledge. Where God is giving you advanced knowledge. Of what the future holds in stock for you. Your sons, your daughters, your loved ones, your family. And that advanced knowledge gives you an advantage over the adversary. And the plan of the adversary is to attack you. So that the advanced knowledge you have never comes to pass. Because I want, I want you to hear me, church. I've been in church for 41 years and I've seen so many great churches and individuals in church destroyed in some of my own churches. And it hurts me and breaks my heart because I see how the enemy have succeeded to lie to you and I to believe that everything is okay. But everything is not okay. 
Because until we see the manifestation of every word of the Lord concerning you, your loved ones, your family, your kids, your church, your community, your nation, until you see the full manifestation, you can't hold your peace. You can't go to rest. I go into Israel a lot. And whenever you go into Israel for 24 7, whatever time you go to the wailing wall at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m., people are packed at the wailing wall praying night and day over the promises of God concerning the nation of Israel. Night and day, they will not hold their peace. They will not relent because the adversary does not relent. And as you hear the sound of my voice, your future and the future of your kids and your grandchildren are at stake. The enemy is contending for your body, for your mind, your emotion, your children, your finances, your loved ones, your grandchildren, and your future. And somebody must rise up and say, no, this is how far you go. In the name of Jesus, it got to stop here. Say yes. Come on, somebody say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Let me tell you something. God has a plan for your life. How many of you believe that? Oh, yes. He said, before you became a clot of blood in your mother's womb, I already had you. I knew you. Tell somebody, you are not a mistake. You are not a mistake. Tell somebody, you are not an accident. You are here for such a time like this. You are not just born. To come into this world, to go to school, make money, buy a house, and have one or two cars and kids, pay your bills, and come to church. You are better than that. You are a game changer. You are a wonder. You are a miracle. You are a sign to your generation. Say yes. So many people are born, and they live and die, and never discover why they came into this world. Jesus, you believe that God has a plan for your life, which I do. Can I also inject this? Satan also has a plan for your life. And that is what the church doesn't understand. God has a plan for you. Satan also has a plan for you. So it's a fight between Satan's agenda for your life and God's agenda for your life. Satan's plan for you and Satan's plans for your kids and for your loved ones. One of the greatest battle is a battle over your body and my body. Because God cannot operate on earth without your body and without my body. And demons cannot operate on earth without your body and without my body. Satan needs your body to carry out his agenda on earth. And God needs your body to carry out his agenda on earth. So there is a fight between good and evil where your body is concerned. God wants your body as a vehicle to carry out his plans on earth. Satan also needs your body because spirits cannot operate on earth without a human body. That's why Jesus had to be born. He had to be born because spirits cannot come to the realm of the earth without a human body. The right of entry to the earth is the womb of a woman. You can't come here without the womb of a woman. That's why the son of God had to be wrapped in the womb of a virgin Mary and come in through the legal entry, which is the womb of a woman. You cannot come here without the womb of a woman. And the Bible said, a body has thou prepared for me. So God himself needed a body as a vehicle to operate through on earth. And demons also need 
our bodies. And the Bible said, there is this treasure in eating vessels. So God needs your body as an eating vessel. The anointing resides inside of this body. And so if the enemy can attack your body with sickness, disease, and infirmity, then it restricts and limits and incapacitates and paralyzes God's agenda because God's plan for your life is going nowhere without your body. And that's why we need to win souls. That's why we have to bring everybody in our community to Christ. Because any human body you see walking there who doesn't have Christ in them, they are carrying a demonic residue. Anybody that is not saved, that is not born again in your family, that does not have Christ and the Holy Ghost living in them, I don't care how much you love them, demons and Satan resides in them and controls them. And if you love them, get Jesus to get in. Because where Jesus comes, the demons must live. Say, I hear you. I want to talk to you for some few minutes. And tomorrow night, Tuesday and Wednesday, I need you to abstain from food for a few hours. Because there's something about fasting and prayer. Jesus said, this kind goeth not out except by fastings and by prayer. Say, I hear you. So there are different kinds of demons in the spirit realm. And Jesus said there are certain stubborn spirits that to confront those stubborn situations and complex situations and difficult situations, it requires fasting and prayers. And we are not fasting anymore. The church is not fasting anymore. We are not casting out devils. Jesus did four things. He taught, he preached, he healed the sick, and he cast out devils. We are preaching, we are teaching, we are not healing the sick, we are not casting out devils. Because when it comes to healing the sick, you have to engage demons. You got to engage them. Because they are responsible for sickness, diseases, infirmities, and affliction. Study the Bible carefully. Jesus went into all the temples and all the synagogues. The first thing he did was to cast out devils in all the synagogues. And then the next thing, he healed them. Jesus. Say Jesus. Jesus. Isaiah chapter 25 and the seven verse. Isaiah 25 and the seven verse. Isaiah 25 and the seven verse. And the seven verse. Uh-huh. And he reads. Uh-huh. And he will destroy in this mountain mm-hmm. the face of covering cast over all people and the veil that is pressed over all nations. Say veil. Veil. Talk to me. Say veil. Veil. Talk to somebody. Turn to somebody. Please sit up. Those of you sleeping, sit up, please. Sit up. Sit up. And one of the places you must never sleep is in church. And let me tell you why you shouldn't sleep in church. Why is the word of the Lord is proceeding? It's going forward. Spirits come out from people. And if you are sleeping, it can just enter you. Especially those of you who sleep and open your mouth. It just comes out and gets into you. Come on, somebody. No, I'm telling you the truth. So try not to sleep in church. Say, I hear you. Somebody say, the veil. Now, veils comes in layers. Say, layers. Number one, there are veils over nations. Number two, there are veils over cities. Number three, there are veils over communities. Number four, there are veils over churches and veils over families, and veils over individual. And until you destroy the veil, the adversary has the advantage. Because the veil is a form of blindness. It blinds you, so you never see the light. You never see your way out. You are stuck, 
and you believe you are okay and even though danger and destruction is coming you believe I'm fine why? because you can't see and that the trick of the adversary is to veil the church and in the name of Jesus this morning tomorrow Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday let the veil cast over this house and over your family and your children be lifted in the name of Jesus let the veil be destroyed somebody say destroy say destroy there's a veil and until the veil is destroyed, the enemy will have the upper hand. Go to Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. Look at something. Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. Can I work with you? Can Ephesians with you? 1. Uh-huh. 17 and 18. 17 and 18. Uh-huh. Then I read. Yeah. That the, God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, the Father, Father of glory, uh -huh. may give unto you the spirit of wisdom uh -huh. and revelation in uh -huh. the knowledge of him. Uh -huh. The eyes of your understanding you be see, enlightened. The eyes of what? Your understanding. The eyes of what? Your understanding. The eyes of what? Your understanding. Maybe what? Be enlightened. Enlightened. And this, he's talking to the church. He's talking to born again. Holy Ghost feel water baptized, spirit filled, blood washed, heavily booked and confirmed. And he said, you need illumination so you can know what is in stock for you. See what is in stock for you. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. that, that my, what is the hope of his calling mm -hmm. and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. There are riches in glory for you and I. But until you see it, you can't possess it. Amen. If you don't see it, you never possess it. There are people, watch this. When Hagar left with Ishmael, Abraham, by Sarah's request, they got to a wilderness place and they ran out of water. And the Bible said that Hagar left Ishmael and went away and she began to cry out. And the voice of the angel of the Lord echoed from eternity into time and said, Hagar, what haileth thee? Go pick up the child and love the child. And the Bible said, and immediately the Lord opened her eyes and she saw a well of water just where she was. Now hear me. She and the son would have died for the lack of water even though what she needed was right where she was. Jesus says it this way. Eyes have they, but they see not. Your greatest problem is the lack of illumination. Your greatest problem is your inability to see. Come to Psalm 13 verse 3. Look at Psalm 13 verse 3. Psalm 13 verse 3. Psalm 13. He said, hacking, hacking. Oh Lord. Psalm 13 verse 3. He says, consider and hear me, uh -huh. O Lord my God. Uh -huh. Let in my eyes Let's I sleep the sleep of death. He said what? Lighten my life. He said, enlighten my eyes. Let's what? I sleep the sleep of death. If you are walking right here right now and you see a snake, are you going to walk on the snake? You avoid it. But if you don't see it, you step on it. Are you hearing me? That is a problem in the church. The enemy has veiled us. He's failed us. I was dealing with a situation. I was dealing with a situation of a pastor in the church. And I want, I want some few men to come to me right now. I want just about four men to come to me quickly. Say, come, four men. All right, I got one here. Yeah, come, four. One more. And I need a, I need a lady for gender balance. Four men. I need one more man and a lady. Okay, yeah. Okay, face, face this way, yeah. And then I need everybody facing him. 
Okay. Now, I need this lady. I saw a strange revelation about a church in a city I went to years ago. This was the revelation. The pastor and the wife had the biggest church in the whole city. Mega church. And for whatever reason, the church started going down. And other churches took over from them. And they went down. And the Lord showed me something, and this was what I saw. So face this young man. So this is a husband and wife here. They are, they are leading. Say leading. They are in the lead. Now the enemy wants to get them to the back. So what he does is to set a conflict between the two of them. Start arguing among yourself. What? what are you doing? No way. No way. Why is they are arguing? Overtake them. Overtake them. No, go, 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 go. Overtake. Overtake. No, 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 no. Come back. Come back. Come back. You all miss it. You all miss it. Come back. Face each other. Whilst you are arguing, I want you to bypass them and go. Just bypass them and go. Be arguing. Bypass them. Go. You to bypass them and go. Go. Bypass them and go. Bypass them and go. Keep going. Just keep going. Okay, stop arguing. After arguing, what has happened? Where are they in the line? They are behind. So whenever the enemy wants to set you back, what he does is to bring conflict and misunderstanding and confusion between you and your spouse and your loved one. Why is he doing that? You are being overtaken by others. And you are standing there. Everybody is arguing. Everybody is right. Why is others are overtaking you? And when I watched, I saw the two of them behind the line. And those who were behind them had gone ahead of them. And I said, Lord, what minute this? And he said, that is how the enemy got them. He brought strife between the husband and the wife. And they started fighting each other. And when they were doing that, he gave the enemy an advantage and allowed others to overtake them. Please sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Now, come to Ephesians. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. From the 10th verse. Finally. 6 verse 10. Uh -huh. And I read. Brethren, Finally, my brethren, uh -huh. be strong in the Lord uh -huh. and in the power of his mind. Put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wires of the devil. He said, put on the whole armor. Ask somebody, how dressed are you this morning? How dressed are you? You know, when I was coming out of the house, my wife said, you need your coat. You need your hat. And I said, why? She said, it's going to be cold. So what was she trying to do? She was getting me to dress for the weather. Or for the occasion. Do you hear me somebody? Spiritually, Bishop, it looks to me that the body and the church is not dressed for the occasion. So we are not dressed spiritually for the wiles of the enemy. And we keep saying, God, why me? Why me? God, why did you allow this? God does not allow bad things to happen to his kids. He's a good God. He's not responsible for the, a, lot of the, a lot of things we blame God for. It's a result of our ignorance. He said, put on the whole armor of God. If you don't dress for the winter and you go out there and you get cold, you don't blame anybody. You need your winter coat. When the weather is bad, you dress for the weather. Spiritually, we are not dressed for the occasion. Go ahead. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Now look at this. Look at this. Principalities. Plural. Say plural. Plural. It didn't say principality. Principal. Plural. There are many. And you think you can stand alone? And that's why you need to be part of the cells. You need to be part of the community fellowship in your community. 
so that the brethren can always be there for you. You can't stand alone. It's dangerous to stand alone. God never intended for any believer to stand alone. It doesn't matter how gifted and anointed you are. You are not anointed and gifted enough to be on your own. Everybody needs somebody. We are interdependent. Even God said, let us make man. He didn't say let me. He said let us. You are not gifted and anointed and smart and intelligent enough to stand alone. Principalities. Against powers. Did he say power? Powers. And then he said against what? Against rulers, rulers of darkness of this world. Mm -hmm. And against spiritual weakness in high places. In high places. There are many. And now watch me. We read these scriptures all the time. I don't think we have exhausted it yet, Bishop. And I don't really think the church understands Ephesians 6, 12. We don't get it. These are the powers that rule and control the political scene, the economic scene, the religious scene the financial sin, and the social sin of nations and cities. And the control part of the church, the divisions in the church, the strife in the churches, they are responsible. They are responsible of families, tragedies, disasters, calamities. They are behind those things. And the church is the only body giving the legal rights to override them. But the church has been veiled. We are veiled. See, I hear you. I hear you. Look at the 13 verse. Wherefore, mm -hmm. take unto you the whole armor of God, uh -huh. that ye may be able to withstand. The first time he said what? Put on. Now he said, take. It means it's within your reach. Tell somebody, the armor of God is within your reach. It's within your reach. It's within your reach. He said, put it on. Now he said, take it. Because if you are not well dressed, you are not going to make it. That is what it is. And we talk about it and talk about it. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. That is it. No. Church, we do wrestle. There is a wrestling going on. You are dealing with unseen beings. We call them unseen personalities. And they are wrestling with your thoughts, your mind. They are bombarding you, mental bombardment, emotional bombardment, physical bombardment. They are on your case. Whether you see them or not, they are real. And the assignment is to overwhelm you and get you to serve the Lord without a testimony. You are coming to church, you are tithing, you are giving an offering, you love the Lord, you are living a good life, and you have no testimony. Do you know how many young sisters in the church are living a sanctified life and I'm married? And I was telling one of my bishops the other day, I said, let me tell you something, bishop. This situation with some of these sisters, we just can't leave them praying on their own. I said, we have to get involved and take personal authority. To release them and release their marriages. Other than that, it ain't going to happen. I'm just telling you. And it's a conspiracy of the enemy. To frustrate them and to eventually get them to compromise their purity. And their sanctification and their testimonies. And everyone I've gotten involved in, all the single ladies in our churches, everyone I get, the bishops and the pastors, we fast, we pray, we get involved with it, we break the curses and lose them, they get married. And some get married, they can't have children, we get involved, they get married. It's a fight. 
And if we don't get involved, just faith confession is not enough. Somebody say, I hear, I hear you. Come with me. Let me show you something. Come with me to Daniel, the ninth chapter. Daniel, the ninth chapter. The first verse. Daniel, chapter nine, verse one. The first one. verse to the third verse. I want to show you something. Daniel. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus. What is the name? Darius. Somebody talk to me. What is the name? Darius. Say it again. Darius. One more time. Darius. Go ahead. Watch the something. son of Ahasuerus, uh -huh. of the seed of the Medes, yes. which was made king over uh -huh. the realm of the Chaldeans. Yes. In the first year of his reign, uh -huh. I, Daniel, understood by the books. Understood by the books. That's why you need to buy the books. Because the books brings understanding. Say the books, the books. The books. Tell somebody, eat the scroll, eat the scroll. Eat the scroll. Tell somebody, buy the books. Buy the books. In the first year of his reign, mm -hmm. I, Daniel, understood by the books. By the books. The number of the years mm -hmm. whereof the mm -hmm. word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. Uh -huh. That he would accomplish 70 years uh -huh. in the desolation of Jerusalem. Uh -huh. And I set my face unto the Lord God uh -huh. to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Stop there. Look at me. Daniel understood by the books. That there was a prophecy that after 70 years had expired that God was going to send them back to Jerusalem for they were sent into captivity for 70 years. And the understanding came to Daniel by the books. Tell somebody, get the books. Get the books. Some of us and our sisters, we invest more money into Indian hair And all kinds of Blazerian hairs and things that we invest in the books. Understanding is not in the hair, it's in the books. Come on, somebody. But he got the books. And by the books, he got an understanding. Say, understanding. understanding. Talk to me, say, understanding, understanding. is necessary, necessary for longevity and freedom. And he got an understanding and he said, I discovered by the books that we are supposed to be in captivity for 70 years. And the 70 years is almost up and it's time to be free. But watch what he did when he discovered the prophecy. He didn't go to sleep. He didn't get excited about it. He didn't go telling everybody about it like we all do. There are some prophecy I've received. I haven't even told my wife about it. And I'm dealing with it. I'm working it. Tell somebody, work it, work it. Work, work. I'm working it in prayer day and night. And I'm contending for the manifestation of that word of the Lord. And I'm telling the adversary, stay on your side of the line. Don't even try it. This prophecy is coming to pass. Say, I hear you, somebody. I hear you. And when he discovered the prophecy, what he began to do, according to scripture, he said he set his face towards the Lord God and began to seek God with what? Prayer, supplication, fastings. Now watch this. What was the name of the king? What was the name? Darius. Say it again. What was the name? Darius. When he began to fast and pray, something happened. Tell somebody, something good is about to happen. You remember that song? Something good is going to happen today. Happen today. This very day. You remember that song? We got to go back to all those songs. I learned it from Evangel years ago. Amen. But he realized that it's not enough to discover and to have understanding. We got to do something with the understanding. So he began to fast and began to pray. Supplications, night and day, relentless before God. And as a result of that, the veil was lifted. Say the veil. Amen. Talk to me, say the veil. the veil. The veil was lifted. A friend of mine had a gift. 
that was given to him by his grandfather from China. And it was a plate with a symbol of the dragon. And he kept it in his house. And he was having a serious problem financially. And he was praying. And then the Lord said, you have the enemy in your house. It's a symbol. And that is a point of contact. And he said, there is no enemy in my house. And he said, what is the dragon doing here? He said, the dragon? He said, yes. So he, he took it and destroyed it. And from that day, the finances immediately turned around. There are points of contact. Say points of contact. Points of contact. Everybody say Lot. You remember Lot? Abraham's nephew Lot? Do you know the meaning of Lot? Lot means a veil. Say a veil. A veil. Turn to somebody and say, who is the veil in your life? Who is the veil in your life? Yeah. Somebody can represent a veil. And as long as they are in your life, you will never see what God wants you to see. And until you see what God wants you to see, you will never be positioned for your miracle. And you will never do what is required of you. Say a veil. Amen. I had a lady come to work for me as a secretary. She was very, very good. Very sharp. And when she came in and I gave her the job, the Spirit of God came upon me and I started praying hours in the day. And the Spirit of God would come upon me and I would fast like crazy. And I said, what is this? I have no desire to eat and I'll be fasting and I'll be praying and, and, and I went on for a couple of months and I didn't like it. I like my food. The African food is spicy. You know, when, when, when I eat the food in America here, I don't sweat. Because it's not spicy. The African food, when you eat it, you sweat. You know, and I have to carry a face towel. Sometimes I let my wife put some African spices in her bag. And we take it to the restaurant and say, baby, you can do that. And I said, girl, it's a compromise. You can't cook the African food. At least for love's sake, put it in your bag. <laughs> so she puts it in a bag. We go to the restaurant. And when they bring the food, I put some of the spicy in the food. And they'll ask me, what is that? And I said, this is a medicine. <laughs> and when I eat with the spices, I feel anointed. And I have to go off eating my spicy food for a long time. And then one day she came to me. She said, I have to leave. And I said, you got to do what? Leave? No, you're not going anywhere. She said, you don't even know me. And I said, what do you mean? You are not leaving. You have all my database. You have all my information. She said, I have to go. And I said, no, you can't go. She said, I have to go. I said, who are you? And she said, I'm a witch. I said, a witch? She said, yes. She said, I was assigned to come and seduce you. And destroy the church. And I said then, you are not living. You are fired in the name of the Lord Jesus. You are not living. You are fired. I'm firing you. By the finger of God. Get out of here. And then one time I went to preach for one of my sons in town who is a bishop. Has a mega church. And I saw her there serving the first lady. And giving the bishop coffee, tea, and all that. And I said, okay, praise the Lord. I finished preaching. I didn't say anything. And I walked out of that place. Because if I opened my mouth, they would say I'm jealous. So I didn't say anything. I just kept my mouth shut and I walked away. And I've had so many people come around me on assignment. I've had people come and give me money. I had a gentleman that came and gave me $5 million to build my first church. And he was in drugs. And the Lord said, don't take that money. And I said, I rebuke that voice in the name of Jesus. <laughs> then later I said, Lord, I repent, forgive me. I plead the blood of Jesus. And I said, Father, you understand that $5 million, they don't just come like that. And I didn't know he was dealing in drugs. I rejected the money unwillingly. I was mad and angry with myself. And I couldn't believe I told him to keep the money. 
And I said it. I don't need that money. With my mouth. But my whole body and everything was saying. Don't take it away. Just leave it with me. Walk away. <laughs> and he left with that money. And few months after he was arrested. He was arrested. He was caught dealing with over 40 million dollars of drugs. And I saw a revelation of a passenger plane. And the passenger plane took off and it went through the weather. And I saw this private jet. It took off and it couldn't go through the weather. And the Lord said, that five million dollars is the private jet. And he said, open it up. Let everybody give what they can. And you will go through it. And that five million dollars was a snare. To destroy me. And to destroy the reputation of the church. And he was on assignment. He bought me a car, a Mercedes Benz. And when he bought me the car, I came home and I saw the car in my garage. And the Lord said, this car is going to bring a lot of scandal and trouble to you. Send it back. I'll be very honest with you, I didn't. I didn't have a car at that time. I was using taxis. So I said, Father, let the blood of Jesus cover this one. <laughs> no, I'm being honest with you. I'm, I just said it. I said, as for this one, I'm not letting it go. Whatever happens, let the blood of Jesus cover it. Thou knowest, O oh Lord, where I am. I'm your servant. Cover me. He didn't say anything. And I drove in it and everybody was happy for me. And when the scandal came, it was front page, my car. And my picture was on front page. For weeks, and I have to return the car back. But it was a setup. He was sent to the church. He came in with a lot of money. And there was something about him. And inside of me, the spirit kept indicating, giving me indication. Watch him. Watch him. He's a takeover. He's a takeover. He's a spiritual hijacker. And I won't listen to the spirit. Because I needed the money. I know you've never been tempted before, but I have. I know you are all angels here. You are spirits. Are you hearing me, somebody? See, I hear you. And from that time, I learned a lot of lessons. I learned a lot of lessons. Somebody gave me a bento. And the Lord said, don't use it. Pack it. And I did few months after something came up and the Lord said, you say why? You see why? I said you should pack it, give it back. Then one of my sons called me. He said, I just ordered a Rolls Royce for you. And I said, I don't need a Rolls Royce. I don't want a Rolls Royce. I said, give me the money for the prayer mountain. I don't need a Rolls Royce. And the Lord said, you did well, son. If we... Don't allow the Holy Spirit to guide us by revelation. We will move into a lot of errors. Because the enemy is looking for you and I. <clears throat> so he fasted, he prayed. And as a result of the fasting and prayer, look at what was revealed. Come with me to Daniel the 10th the chapter. Daniel the 10th chapter. Daniel 10. 12 and 13. Look at something. 12 and 13. Yeah. Then said he unto me, uh -huh. Fear not, Daniel, mm -hmm. for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard. When and was I, his words heard? When was his words heard? The first day. When was his words heard? The first day. I want you to look at me. Do you know that so many of you seated here, you have prayed, soul seed. Believe God for breakthroughs and miracles. But your breakthrough and your miracle has been withheld. Because you haven't persevered. You haven't persevered. It's dangerous to give up too early. Are you hearing me, somebody? When was his prayers heard? The first day. When was his words answered? Say the first day. The first day. Go ahead, look at something. 
and stand upright, for unto thee am, am I now sent. Uh -huh. When he had spoken these words unto me, I stood uh -huh. trembling. Uh -huh. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, uh -huh. for from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand uh -huh. and to chasten thyself before thy God, uh -huh. thy words were heard, and uh -huh. I'm come to I'm come for thy words. Mm -hmm. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia. The what? The prince. The what? The prince. The what? The prince. Everybody say double ruler. Double ruler. Say it again. Double ruler. One more time. Double ruler. What am I saying here? There was a natural ruler. What was his name? Darius. And there was an unseen ruler. What was his name? The prince of Persia. See, powers behind the scenes. Powers behind the scenes. I have dealt with a lot of diseases and I've dealt with crises. You talk about crises, I've dealt with crises with nations. I'm telling you. And most of the time, I get a breakthrough when the Lord, by revelation, takes me behind the scenes. Let me tell you something. I was dealing with a lady. She had a serious depression issue. And she'd been to all kinds of men of God to pray and it would not lift. So she came to see me. And when she told me about her situation and how she's had all these men of God pray and nothing has happened, I said to myself, I'm not praying for this lady. I'll be the next man of God that prayed and nothing happened. So I'm not praying for her. So she talked, talked, she cried, and I looked at her, and I said, okay, girl, I don't think I can pray for you. You got to fast and pray and do something better than this. I'm not praying. Whilst I was talking, the Spirit of God gave me a revelation, and I said to her, when your mother was dying, who was the last person by her bed? I didn't know the mother had died. And she said she was the last person by her mother's bed. And I said, tell me about your mother's personality. And she said her mother was always depressed, always sad, always complaining. And she has become just like her mother. And I said, okay, I can pray for you now. Because I knew what was going on. When the mother was leaving her body, that same demon that oppressed the mother, attached itself to the daughter. So I said, pray with me. And I said, say in the name of Jesus, I am the redeemer of the Lord, and I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And on that note, I command my spirit, soul, and body to be acquitted, discharged, disengaged from my mother's demon and from my mother's curse and from my mother's yoke. And I said, come on, and say in the name of Jesus, you foul spirit, you exacted on my mother, you will not exact on me. Be arrested in the name of Jesus. And after that prayer, it lifted and never came again. Are you hearing me, somebody? And the only reason why it happened was because I understood by revelation what was behind the situation. Tell somebody, there is something behind the scenes dealing with you. And listen, I've dealt with financial situations of churches, of individuals, of businesses. And uh, there are always conspiracies. Say conspiracies. conspiracies. Listen, until Daniel fasted and prayed for 21 days, nobody knew that there was a personality by the name of Prince of Persia, who was governing the nation. There was a natural ruler, but there was an unseen ruler. So who was in charge? Hello? Talk to me, who was in charge? It wasn't King Dairos that was in charge. It was the Prince of what? The Prince of what? The Prince of what? He was in charge, not Dairos. Now, you know how the change came? 
Let me show you something. Come with me. Look at the 10th chapter. Look at the 10th chapter. Look at the 10th chapter. Look at the 20th verse. 20th verse. Mm -hmm. Then said he, Knoweth thou wherefore I come unto thee? Mm -hmm. And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. Mm -hmm. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Gracia shall come. How many of you did history at school? Wave at me. You did history at school. You remember that after the kingdom of Persia fell, the next kingdom that came was the kingdom of Greece. You remember Greece? Yeah. You know why the kingdom of Greece came? It was a result of Daniel's 21 days prayer and fasting. In order for there to be permanent change in the natural, we need to effective in the spirit. See, I hear you. Permanent change are a result of victories won in the spirit. If you don't win it in the spirit, it will be permanent. It will be just there for a season and something will hit you again. You want a permanent breakthrough, you have to effect it in prayer. And it was after that 21 days <clears throat> when the angel went back and defeated the prince of Persia, then came another kingdom. But watch this. There was a prince behind that kingdom. What was the name of that kingdom? Greece. Say Greece. Greece. Say Greece. Greece. What was, who was the natural ruler of the kingdom of Greece? Say Alexander the Great. Say Alexandria. Say Alexandria. Say Alexandria. Now watch this. If you study history, it was said that Alexandria conquered every nation. And he was so fearless that he cried one day and said to his generals, is there no nation to conquer? And they said, there is none. You've conquered every nation. Where did he derive his powers from? The prince. Say the prince. Say the unseen ruler and the natural ruler. And a lot of the problems we have are a result of unseen rulers who agitate. When I was a young preacher, I had a problem in my country. And I was arrested. And I was put in prison. And they said I was a security risk to my country because it was then a revolutionary government. And things were very rough in those days. And then there was an attempt of assassination to kill me on a particular day. It was a Wednesday. And the word of the Lord came on Tuesday night. We were praying. And the word of the Lord came and said, at 8.30 on Wednesday, they are coming for you. And it's assassination. It's the spirit of the assassin. It's coming for you. And then the word of the Lord said, and the reason is to stop the revival that is coming to the land through you. So it's not about you. It's about the move of God coming. And so the Lord told me what to do. He said, resist the arrest. And I will put my fear in them and they won't touch you. At 8.30 on Wednesday, I watched my watch. Three men armed came. And I said, what do you want? And they said, we have instructions to pick you up. And I said, from where? Secret service. And I said, I resist the arrest. You are not taking me. And they said, what did you say? And I said, I'm not coming with you. You have an assignment to pick me up to kill me, and I'm not dying today, and I'm not dying tomorrow. When I said that, they panicked because nobody knew their secret, and they didn't know how I got to know. And then one of them said, who told you? And I said, the man at the top there. <laughs> but watch this. Let me tell you what had happened. Before then, they have tried several times to come for me, but every time they were given instruction to pick me up, something happened and they couldn't come for me. Now, this was what happened. President Oral Roberts came to Ghana with Archbishop Idahosa, my spiritual father, and did a crusade. And Oral Roberts put in his newsletters that my church was one of Idahosa's churches. And it wasn't, but he was my spiritual father. And I was arrogant and young. So I wrote to Ora Robert, you have to apologize to me because my church is not under Benson Idahosa. So Ora Robert sent the letter to Benson Idahosa. So Idahosa sent for me and I said, I'm not coming. 
And he wrote me a letter and said, you are not coming. You are on your own. I take my hands off you. That was when all my crisis began. And all hell broke loose. And I prayed every prayer and it didn't work. And I was told where he was. So I went to London and I met him. And I fell on my face. I held his foot. I said, mercy. Mercy. And this was the prayer he prayed. He said, Satan, this is between me and my son. Stay out of it. And it was after that prayer, the whole thing lifted. And the secret service told me that they have been given instructions several times before to pick me up. And any time they tried, something went wrong. Until that year, and I remember it was when I had a conflict with Idahosa. Let me tell you people, if anybody decides to leave this church, make sure that the church you go to the pastor is more anointed than your bishop. I'm telling you. Few things you must not do. Don't live without his blessings. Don't live with his anger. Number three. Don't go to anybody he disapproves of. And number four. Don't go to anybody... That is less anointed than him. I'm telling you. It won't be well with you. I know what I'm telling you. I've been in church for many years. You see, when, when Reuben sinned against Jacob, and Jacob cursed Reuben and disinherited him, when Moses was blessing all the children of Jacob, he blessed everybody. When he came to Reuben, he could not bless Reuben. He took his hands off. And listen to what he said. He said, oh Lord, let not Reuben die and let not his men be few. That was all he could do. Why? Because Moses was a son of Jacob. So he didn't have spiritual authority to override the father's curse on Reuben. He couldn't. He couldn't touch it. He backed off. Because when he met God at the burning bush and he said to the Lord, who are you? He said, I am the God of your fathers. I am the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. And I'm the God of Jacob. So Moses, even though he was gifted, he was of a spiritual, he was a lesser spiritual ranking officer when he came to Jacob. So he couldn't override Jacob's curse over Reuben. The church is missing it. We follow people who are gifted. We follow sons instead of fathers. Sons don't give you the coat of many colors. It's fathers who give the coat of many colors. Sons don't cover. It's fathers who cover. Sons don't bless. It's fathers who bless. So if you want a blessing, stay with a father. Don't follow a son. And especially sons who betray their fathers, you must never follow them because their lifespan will not last. Any son who breaks away from his father is a Luciferian. It's Lucifer's son. You are a Luciferian and you are an Absalom. You will hang yourself. It's just a matter of son. I have seen a lot of sons who broke away from my churches and they died prematurely. Some of them, they became big overnight and people left and went and I just kept quiet. And it was just a matter of time and they withered and they scattered and others broke away from them. And those who left came back and I kept quiet. And I'll tell you why. You don't curse what God has blessed. And let me explain that to you. When Adam and Eve sinned, God did not curse Adam and Eve. He punished them, but he cursed the earth. And he said, for thy sake, the ground is what? Curse. Go to Genesis 9 and look at Genesis 9 and 1. Look at Genesis chapter 9 and verse Genesis 1. Look chapter at something there. 9 and, and verse 1. 1. Uh -huh. And God blessed Noah and his sons uh -huh. and said unto them, be fruitful. Stop there. Stop there. Look at me. I don't know why I'm saying this, but let me just flow with the spirit. Hear me. Look at me. God blessed Noah and who? Again, Noah and who? His sons. 
A lot of people ask me, is the black man cursed? No. The black man was not cursed. And I'll prove it to you here. Who uncovered the nakedness of Noah? Ham. Say Ham. Ham. It was Ham. Now, who was cursed? No. Ham was not cursed. It was Canaan. Canaan. You know why Ham was not cursed? Ham was not cursed because God had already blessed Ham. He blessed Noah and his three sons, which included Ham. So because Ham was blessed, Noah could not curse what God has blessed. So what Noah did was to go past Ham to the last born who was Canaan and he placed the curse of Canaan because Canaan was not there when the blessing was pronounced over him and the three sons. Now the black man came from one of Ham's sons by the name of Cush. And the word Cush means the man with the dark skin. And Cush was not cursed. It was Canaan that was cursed. So the black man was not cursed. I'll tell you what our problem is some other time, not today. Maybe from tomorrow. We have self-hatred. We don't love ourselves. We prefer others. If we begin to love ourselves, we'll be fine, we'll be better. Are you hearing me, somebody? See, I hear you. I'm going to stop here because there's so much I want to say, but I'm going to wait tomorrow night, Tuesday night and Wednesday. I want to pray and I want to lose some people. And as much as, 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 much as possible, please don't be walking away, please. Unless you have to go to work or you have something very important to do. There's a culture in America that must change. There's a culture of importance in America that I don't understand where it came from. Everybody is important. Everybody is a star. And it's like we don't have time for God. And yet we want the move of God. If you want the move of God, you have it on his terms, not on your terms. The reason why we get results and miracles in Africa is because when we come to church, we put our watches aside and we want God. I hear you. Tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I want you to fast. I want to help you. That's what I do. I help people. By the time I'm through with you for these three days, you will see miracles, checks in the mail, debt cancellation, miracles in your body, breakthroughs in your finances, relationships, marriages. It will blow your mind. But let me tell you something. They are not anything new. These things are there for you but it's been withheld. And because you haven't done anything to unblock and to unlock it, the enemy is holding it back. But within these three days, we're going to open fire on the enemy. We'll put pressure on the adversary and tell him to take his hands up and he can't hold on to what is yours anymore. He's going to have to let it go. Say, I hear you. No, I don't like your attitude. I say, say, I hear you. Come on, talk to me. Amen. I've been, I've been here for three weeks and I haven't preached for anybody. I haven't preached for, I have a lot of churches. I haven't preached for any of my churches or any of my friends. They've all asked me, come preach, and I haven't been to preach for anybody. John Jenkins, many. They said, oh, come preach. I haven't gone anywhere. So you are very blessed for me to be here. So you better be nice. <laughs> Amen. And not just that, I'm not just here this morning, but... I'm spending three days to help you because I love you. And I want to see you break through. I'm just sick and tired of seeing the devil fooling with God's kids. See, I hear you. But hear me, until Daniel fasted and prayed, realized that nobody knew that there was another ruler who was responsible for the governance of the kingdom of Persia. They thought it was Dairos, but it wasn't. It was who? The prince. The prince. 
Tell somebody, somebody behind the scenes is responsible for the things you can't make sense of. I'm telling you. I know what I'm telling you. I've seen it over and over and over and over again. I had a friend of mine, he had the biggest church in Europe 30 years ago. And I was there on a Sunday morning and Dr. Lester Summerall from South Bend, Indiana came to preach. Great man, I loved him. Powerful. Bishop should know him. Bishop knows them all. Uh, he knows everybody. <clears throat> and Dr. Summerall preached a message and prophesied of a great revival coming to Europe, which has happened. And he said it will begin in that church. After the service, we went for breakfast. And I said, I said, Michael, you all need to declare fast. You got to pray on this. He said, why? I said, the adversary is going to come after you and this church. He said, what do you mean? God said it. That settles it. He will do it. I said, you're joking. I said, the enemy now has clear indication that the revival that is coming will come through this house. So he will come after this house. And I left it alone. I was a young preacher from Ghana at that time. He used to give me like $1,000 every month. I didn't want to lose it. <laughs> so when I said it a few times, he wouldn't listen. I just left it alone so I wouldn't lose my $1,000. I needed it. <laughs> I'm sorry about it, but uh, I had to do that those days. I didn't want him to be upset with me and cut it off. So I just said, okay, brother, I agree with you. You're right. You're right. Cut a long story short, the enemy came after that church. It was the biggest church in Europe. Everybody preached there. All the big names you can talk about in the Word of Faith movement. Everybody preached in that church. If you don't preach in that church, you are not anointed. Everybody went there. The enemy came against that church. He lost the church. He ended up with cancer, leukemia. The wife had cancer. The enemy came against the kids and messed everything up and took the church from him. And the revival, the prophecy came to pass. The revival happened, but he was removed from the place. And for over 30 years now, he's tried everything and nothing has worked. And he's still my friend. I love him very much. Great guy, good man. But... He misunderstood the rules of engagement. Somebody say the rules of engagement. Somebody say divine protocols. There are protocols in the spirit. If you don't follow it, the enemy can mess you up. And like, like for instance, Bishop teach on the tithes. If you are not a tither, there is nothing God can do to help you when the devourer comes to devour your finances. He can't help you. The only thing that stops the devourer is not prayer and fasting. It's the obedience of giving the tithe, paying the tithe. That is the only thing that stops the devourer. It's the same thing when it comes to other protocols and rules of engagement. Fasting and prayer has its place in the life of believers. Old Testament fasted, New Testament fasted. And we need to come before God and we're going to deal with some few things. Number one, we need to arrest family crisis. Somebody say family crisis. Say it again. Number two, say health complications. You see, let me tell you something. A lot of the diseases some of you are dealing with is not from God. I'm telling you. I have one of my bishop with me. He's here right now. And a few days ago, he fell. He fell in the bathroom. So we called 911, and they came for him. After a few hours, they called, and they said he had a kidney failure. And I said, no, I don't accept it. So the number one kidney guy in the whole world is from Ghana. He's in New York. He has over 2,000 doctors under him. He was trained by a Jewish doctor, a kidney specialist. I sent him there. And when they went and they checked him, they said, no, it's not a kidney failure. And he knew exactly what it was. And I smiled because I told them that this thing they said is two things. is a demonic prescription and diagnosis. 
Say demonic diagnosis. And prescription. Go to Isaiah chapter 1 verse 10. Look at something in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 10. Isaiah chapter 10 verse 1. Look at Isaiah 10 1. Isaiah chapter 10 verse 1. Say demonic diagnosis. Demonic diagnosis. And prescription. And prescriptions. And I read. Uh -huh. Woe unto them uh -huh. that decree unrighteous decree. Unrighteous decree. There are a lot of you, you are dealing with unrighteous decrees in the spirit. And it's something to do with your family. I was dealing with a lady yesterday and I said to her, where is your mom? And she said, the mom is dead. And I said, what killed your mom? And she said, cancer. And I said, what is killing you? And she said, cancer. And the mom was a believer, and she is a believer. And she said, why did you ask me what killed my mom? And I said, the same demon that killed your mother has attached itself to you to kill you. And she's a first lady of a church. And I said, put aside your first lady and go into... A battle, go into a fight right now and let's arrest that demon because that same spirit that killed your mother has attached itself to you and if you don't deal with it, it will kill you and you will go to heaven before your time. And a lot of Christians are dying and going to heaven before their time. You can look at me with that Maryland look <laughs> as much as you want to, but I'm telling you the truth. That as a believer, you cannot be possessed by demons, but demons can harass you, they can buffet you, they can attach themselves to your personality. I'm telling you. I have seen so many things happen to believers and to great men and women of God who should have been alive and dead because they didn't understand the rules of engagement and divine protocols. If you are a Christian and you eat seven days a week, Throughout the year, you are weak. You can't eat seven days a week, the whole year as a Christian, and you don't fast a day or twice in the week. You have given prominence to your body and deny your spirit access. You got to learn how to bring your body under. See, I hear you. Go ahead. Finish that scripture. Look at something. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees uh -huh. and that right grievousness uh -huh. which they have prescribed. Say prescribe. Prescribe. Say demonic prescription. Demonic prescription. Say it again. Demonic prescription. You know what that means? You know what it means? There are people whom demons in their bloodline and family has prescribed certain specific prescription about how their life and their family must be. So when you see things happen in their life, it's a result of something programmed in the spirit that is playing out in their lives. And yet they are in church. And they are born again. But what is going on is a demonic prescription and is being executed and enforced by demons. Because they don't understand the rules of engagement. They don't understand kingdom protocols. They have light and knowledge of one thing, but they lack knowledge and light in other areas. Stand on your feet, let us pray.